Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more conversations. Kai Bird is with us. Kai Bird won a Pulitzer Prize for his biography of Robert Oppenheimer. The book, written with the late historian Martin Sherwin, is entitled American Prometheus, The Triumph and Tragedy of J. Robert Oppenheimer. It is the inspiration for the hit movie starring Killian Murphy in the title role. Oppenheimer, known as the father of the atomic bomb project at Los Alamos, New Mexico in the 1940s, became a victim of the McCarthy hysteria in 1954 when an ad hoc board revoked his security clearance. Oppenheimer's story led Senator J. William Fulbright in a speech on the Senate floor to say, let us remember not only what his special genius did for us, let us also remember what we did to him. Sticking with biography as his muse, Kai is currently working on a new biography of disgraced lawyer fixer Roy Cohn. Kai is also a distinguished lecturer at the CUNY Center for Biography. We are pleased to welcome Kai Bird to the program. Thank you, Jim. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, congratulations on your book. Many weeks, number one on the New York Times bestseller list, years after its initial publication. 18 years after its publication. It's a miracle. They finally <laughs> discovered you. Pulitzer Prize, a film, the top grossing biopic of all time, $900 million. Up there week after week with Barbie. Did you ever think it would come to that? <laughs> no, it's most improbable. <laughs> Barbie and Oppenheimer, but... Uh, why not? Now, what is it about the story of uh, Oppie that uh, is uh, so intriguing to so many people? Well, I think he symbolizes, you know, some very relevant issues in our own times. Nuclear weapons. Uh, I, I noticed today in the newspaper in the New York Times, there's an interview with the Finnish president warning about uh, how the Russians might actually come to use tactical nuclear weapons in the Ukraine. So this is a really relevant issue. And Oppenheimer himself was the father of the atomic bomb, but he then went on to warn us against relying on these weapons. And then there's also the issue of McCarthyism. He became the chief celebrity victim of the McCarthy era. And we're still living with that, the seeds of that politics. It's a very divisive politics and McCarthyism. And you mentioned Roy Cohn. These, these men uh, planted the seeds of our Trump era divisive politics. And then there's the issue of, of science and technology. We're on the verge of another revolution in artificial intelligence and medical breakthroughs, and we need more scientists as public intellectuals. And that's what Oppenheimer was, but he was stripped of his ability to be a public intellectual in that 1954 trial. Now, uh, you've written a number of biographies in your uh, career. In fact, uh, you mentioned in the same breath with the uh, iconic American biographers, David McCullough and uh, um, John Meacham and um, Robert Caro. Uh, why does biography matter? Why do you think biography is the proper medium for a, a story like this? Well, I'm glad you asked that. It's, I think personally, it's just biography is the best vehicle for conveying human stories, history. Uh, you know, it, people can turn the page when they're reading about one person's life because they can be empathetic about that small life. But the life itself is always complicated and it tells a larger story. And if you choose the right subject, uh, Oppenheimer is a fascinating figure, you learn a lot of history along the way. So. Uh, it's, it's a compelling medium. And here at City University, you know, I lead a biography center, the Leon Levy Center for Biography, which is a unique institution. It, uh, our job is to promote the art and craft of biography in the academy and to, by giving fellowships largely to working biographers. So uh, tell us, uh, how did you get involved with the uh, uh, the project of uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer so many years ago? Well, I, my first biography was on John J. McCloy, a powerful Wall Street lawyer here in New York, and he was a friend of Oppenheimer's. 
And so in the course of writing about McCloy, I, I did a little research and had to write about Oppen Oppenheimer as well. And then my second biography was on McGeorge Bundy, and he too was a friend of Oppenheimer's. And that book came out in 98. And by that time, I was friends and colleagues with Martin Sherwin, a great historian. And Marty had been working on Oppenheimer since 1980. <laughs> yeah, you know, so 19, 20 years later into the research, he had accumulated 50,000 pages of archival documents and done 150 interviews. And, and he hadn't written a word. He hadn't started to write. Um, so he came to me. He was a funny guy. He knew I was unemployed in between projects. I hadn't landed on a new, new book project. Um, so he came to me and he says, you know, Kai, I want you to join me on this Oppenheimer project. And if you decline, my gravestone is going to read, he took it with him. <laughs> Meaning lots of research, no book. No book. <laughs> um, so I, he persuaded me that it was a great topic and, and that we could collaborate together. And it turned into a wonderful po partnership. Let's just pause for a moment. Uh, Oppenheimer, I think you'll agree, was a complicated and flawed, in many ways, individual. And uh, the, uh, your other subjects, or some of your other subjects, uh, let's start with uh, McCloy. McCloy was uh, uh, a lion of Wall Street. At the same time, he was responsible probably for the Japanese internment. He was responsible for the decision not to bomb the railroad tracks leading to Auschwitz. That's right. Yep. Uh, Bundy, uh, Bundy was an American Brahmin from Boston. Uh, so was his brother, and uh, we can thank them for the Vietnam War in many ways. Uh, so, are you intrigued with people who have a tragic flaw? I'm intrigued with these individuals who explain how power works in America. And, you know, lawyers are very key to answering that question. <laughs> they play a major role. Um, but yes, I think people that have been involved in, in powerful decision-making roles in Washington and Wall Street, uh, they inevitably end up making some errors and mistake, mistaken judgments. And so, yes, Bundy, I thought, was a fascinating figure because he, here he was a liberal, a Harvard, former Harvard dean, national security advisor to Kennedy and Johnson, a very smart guy. But he got us into Vietnam. He was one of the major architects. And so I wanted to figure out why, what happened there. And likewise, McCloy. Uh, you know, he was a symbol of the American foreign policy establishment. But then, as you mentioned, he was cl closely associated with and defended the internment of the Japanese Americans during World War II. Uh, and he was the guy who refused to, to bomb, bomb Auschwitz in 1944. Uh, and, you know, he, he was associated with all sorts of other controversial decisions. So uh, it was fun writing about these men. Likewise, Oppenheimer is. Uh, you know, endlessly mysterious. Uh, he's very complicated. You know, he, in the 1920s and 30s, he's on the cusp of quantum physics, but he's never administered more than a half dozen graduate students at Berkeley. And then he's selected to become the scientific director of this secret city in the middle of the desert of New Mexico and Los Alamos. Los Alamos. The Manhattan and, Project. And he's, going to build this bomb and direct the project with 6,000 people, engineers and physicists and Nobel Prize winners, um, and he succeeds at doing it. He never won a Nobel Prize. He never he? won a Nobel himself. But he, he, when he was asked by uh, General Groves, who was supervising him, uh, you never won a Nobel Prize. And he <laughs> said, well, uh, 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 Nobel uh, uh, started the whole thing. He invented dynamite. So right. uh, <laughs> right. Uh, maybe I, maybe can, I can get it for the <laughs> atom bomb. But the initial impetus, the rush to uh, achieve the construction of the atom bomb was they had to get it before the Nazis did. That was Oppenheimer's motivation. So 1945 rolls around. Uh, Hitler is finished. Uh, the Nazis didn't come up with the bomb. Uh, 
Uh, certainly the Japanese didn't have the bomb, uh, and, uh, but the bomb was perfected. It was tested at Los Alamos. And then uh, suddenly, uh, even though Eisenhower said the Japanese are on their knees, they've been defeated, other generals said the same thing. Uh, Harry Truman, George Marshall, others decide to bomb uh, Hiroshima, Nagasaki. They could have tested it somewhere to show we had it. Uh, and uh, Hiroshima, what, 66,000 died, and, uh, Nagasaki, 39,000 died. At least. Uh, at least. A contrast with the others you mentioned, Bundy, McCloy, uh, they expressed no remorse over these controversial decisions that they made that uh, in many cases were responsible for the deaths of many people. But Oppenheimer uh, was agonized, wasn't he? Tell us about that. Well, he, he's, he plays a very paradoxical role. You know, he's the father of the atomic bomb. He makes this happen. He invents the gadget. In the spring of 1945, his own scientists hold a public meeting in, the, in Los Alamos asking, well, why are we working so hard on this? The Germans are defeated. Uh, the Japanese can't possibly have a nuclear weapon, and the war there in the Pacific is winding down. And Oppenheimer steps forth and makes the argument, well, Niels Bohr, remember when he came to visit us in Los Alamos on the last day of 1943, he had one question for me. He says, Robert, is it big enough? Hmm. Is it big enough to end all war? So that was our, uh, Oppenheimer's argument to persuade his scientists to continue working on this. And he actually also, you know, participated in some of the meetings to decide on how to use it. And he was convinced that it had to be demonstrated in combat uh, dramatically somehow to persuade humanity to understand how, how what, what a terrorizing weapon this was and so that the next war would not be fought with two adversaries, both armed with nuclear weapons that might lead to you know, Armageddon. Uh, so it's a complicated argument. And then after the bomb is used, he suddenly realizes from briefings in Washington that the Japanese were indeed virtually already defeated. And so he becomes very conflicted and he spends the rest of his life you know, warning us that this is a, a weapon unlike anything else. It's a weapon for aggressors. It's not a defensive weapon. It's a weapon of terror. And so here we are. Weapon of mass destruction. Yes. And uh, the interesting thing is it's almost a psychological study, and it comes through in your book, which uh, I thought was a great, great uh, contribution to the uh, public record, but uh, how he uh, felt uh, this remorse, this agony that uh, he had given mankind uh, the uh, instrument perhaps of destroying itself. Uh, absolutely, you know, and he, you know, in his first meeting with Harry Truman in October of 45, he goes into the Oval Office and he's trying to persuade Harry, you know, that this is a dangerous weapon and we shouldn't, you know, rely on it. We should try to find a way to achieve international international arms control agreements with the Russians and the others. And Truman suddenly interrupts him and says, well, Dr. Oppenheimer, when do you think the Russians are going to get this, this atomic bomb? And Oppenheimer says, well, I'm not sure, but someday, maybe soon. And Truman disputes him and says, well, I know, never. And at that moment, Oppenheimer understands that the president of the United States doesn't understand that there are no secrets anymore to the, this weapon, that the physics is known, it's just an engineering problem, and that of course the Russians are going to get it. And so he says exactly the wrong thing to Harry Truman. He says, well, you don't understand. I feel I have blood on my hands. <laughs> well, the meeting ended very shortly after that. <laughs> And Truman, in effect, says, uh, what are you belly aching about? Uh, you built the bomb, but I decided to use it. I, right. And uh, there's a difference. Uh, but, of course, he put uh, the weapon in the hands of, uh, of the warrior. Um, so 
That having uh, been said, uh, and here he is, uh, conscience-stricken, and becomes an advocate for arms control. He is wary of uh, the development of the hydrogen bomb. Uh, now, Los Alamos in uh, the Manhattan Project in the 1940s is kind of a hotbed of intrigue. The uh, a number of, uh, among the physicists, there are a number of communists, ex-communists. Uh, Julius Rosenberg worked there at a, at a very low level. Um, and uh, Oppenheimer himself was uh, admittedly kind of a fellow traveler. He, uh, his uh, wife was a former communist. His right, he was a man of the left. Girlfriend was uh, a, a former communist. Uh, and um, I mean, not all the communists were spies, uh, but that gave rise to uh, the second part of the story. Exactly. Yeah, no, Oppenheimer was a man of the left, like many other intellectuals in the midst of the Depression in the 1930s. Uh, but we argue, Marty and I came to the conclusion that he never actually joined the Communist Party. He was on the fringes of its activities. He gave money to projects supported by the CP. Um, but he certainly never spied. He never did anything like that. Uh, his but, brother was his brother was a communist. His and he, brother was a member and he of the also Communist Party. He also worked at uh, Los and Alamos. And he also worked at Los Alamos. Uh, Kitty Oppenheimer, his wife, was a former Communist Party member. Um, so, for all of these reasons, after the war, the, simultaneously, Oppenheimer was coming out publicly against building the hydrogen bomb. He he thought that it was ridiculous to build something even bigger, even more destructive. Um, and that earned him many political enemies inside the Washington defense establishment, uh, and specifically the animosity of Louis Straws, the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission appointed by Dwight Eisenhower. And so in 1953, um, Straws and others used Oppenheimer's left-wing political history in the 1930s and early 40s against him. And, uh, but their real motivation was to bring him down, in the words of Edward Teller, to defrock him in his own church so that he couldn't have a sta any standing in, as a public intellectual speaking out against nuclear weapons. And so they were going after him because he was opposed to the hydrogen bomb. But they used his left-wing political affiliations against him and had this secret trial that went on for a month and violated their own procedures in order to strip him of his security clearance. And then they leaked the transcript of what had occurred during that month. And he became a national pariah uh, and a, sort of the chief celebrity victim of the McCarthy era. Uh, and what interests me in, uh, about it is that uh, Oppenheimer really didn't have to go through with the trial. That's right. Uh, he, he could have walked away. He could have walked away. Einstein told him to walk away. Right. Uh, and Straws uh, didn't have to do it either because uh, his security clearance was about to expire. And if you uh, doubted uh, the loyalty of uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer, he was simply a consultant yeah. uh, to the Atomic Energy Commission, so you could stop giving him work. Right. Uh, and uh, it wouldn't have been the humiliation. So then you have uh, the scenario, which you have referred to in the book as two scorpions in a bottle uh, killing each other because uh, Oppenheim was really finished. And it led to Straws being rejected as uh, Secretary of Commerce uh, just after a few confirmation years later, hearings right. just a few years later. Uh, so they were both destroyed in terms of their public uh, persona, their public reputation. Uh, and for what? It really, uh, you wonder. But uh, what uh, this had all the elements, uh, in a way, of Greek tragedy, uh, didn't it? Uh, oh, it was very dramatic, that trial, and then what happened to him afterwards. And there were attempts, of course, to sort of rehabilitate him later. And... President John F. Kennedy, one of the last decisions he made before he went off to Dallas to be assassinated was to uh, decide that Oppenheimer should be given the Fermi Prize, a $50,000 uh, 
medal and uh, award as, as for his scientific contributions. And of course, President Johnson uh, went through with the award ceremony in the White House. Um, so there were, you know, people understood that what had happened to Oppenheimer was a tragedy and a miscarriage of justice. Um, and it's something, as I said, we're still living with because uh, you, you see very few scientific experts these days uh, performing as intellectual uh, policy makers. Uh, you know, scientists are, are suspect. Uh, we saw this during the recent pandemic where public health officials were questioned. Were Dr. Honest, Fauci. Dr. Fauci. The same Demonized. Thing. Yeah. So, and, and I, I trace this back to what happened to Oppenheimer as a scientist, as a public intellectual in 1954. And, you know, he was discredited. And that sent a message to all scientists, you know, beware of getting out of your little narrow lane of expertise and uh, beware of talking about policy or politics. And, and that's a terrible burden for a society that is like ours, drenched in science and technology and facing all sorts of difficult public issues, uh, you know, how to, decisions on how to use this technology. We need this expertise, but scientists are distrusted in our society and, and that's a tragedy. Uh, so now, how do you relate all this uh, to Roy Cohn? Well, you know, in 1954, Roy Cohn was chief counsel to Senator Joe McCarthy, and he actually persuaded Op uh, McCarthy to try to subpoena Oppenheimer to come and force him to testify about his uh, links to communism back in the 1930s. And... Eisenhower, the Eisenhower administration actually prevented this from happening because they thought that McCarthy would uh, mess up the, the, any such hearing. And they had plans for, Oppen plans for dealing with Oppenheimer with this secret security hearing. So they sent over Vice President Nixon to tell Roy Cohn and Joe McCarthy to back off. <laughs> so I thought that was fascinating. And, and then, you know, Roy Cohn is just a very colorful figure who I write about in all of my previous biographies on McCloy, on the Bundys, uh, even in my last book, a biography of Jimmy Carter. Uh, he, he was involved in uh, uh, the Carter administration in that he uh, attempted to smear Hamilton Jordan, the chief of staff to Jimmy Carter, alleging that he had uh, sniffed cocaine in Studio 54. Uh, which anyway, Roy Cohn frequented. Which Roy Cohn was a frequent uh, visitor to. And then you see a relationship between uh, Louis Straws and Roy Cohn that uh, they both were willing to uh, destroy someone's reputation and uh, based on guilt by association and in your Yeah, it's the same sort of pattern, the same sort of political behavior. And then, of course, Roy Cohn comes back to New York in the, in, in the mid-50s and becomes a lawyer and uh, becomes a lawyer to all five mob families in New York City. And then in 1973... More than just a lawyer. I mean, they had meetings in his office uh, yeah, because they thought the, the FBI wouldn't bug a lawyer's office. And <laughs> right. he attended, when they got rubbed out, he attended their funerals and yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, professed grief. Uh, he was uh, very close to his clients, to say the least. And one of his very interesting clients was a man named Donald Trump. Whom he met in 1973. In a bar. In a bar here in New York. And, uh, you know, they, Roy Cohn became his lawyer for, until he died in 1986. And he, he and Trump bonded. And Roy Cohn taught the young Donald Trump how to act in the public arena, how to always double down, how to never apologize, how to always counter sue, uh, how to deal with the press, how to tell the big lie. Smear the prosecutor. Uh, yeah, and this is the, you know, he gave Donald Trump the playbook for Trump's political career. Trump's playbook. So I have a question for you, Kai Bird. 
Uh, and the question is, uh, does uh, biography inform us as to the arc of history? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's... As it, it, it's as I said, it's it's the best vehicle for conveying history. It's accessible. It's readable history, but it's actually also you know grounded in footnotes mm -hmm. <laughs> and facts and the archives and interviews and uh, you know it's an endless sort of detective quest. A, treasure hunt for finding facts. And, and that's why it takes so long. That's why it's actually the most rigorous form of, of academic scholarship. Uh, the so. most rigorous form of academic scholarship. So Kai Bird, thank you so much for coming by. I'm so sorry we've run out of time because this has been fascinating. Well, and, thank you, Jim. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations. I'm Jim Zirin. Meanwhile, take care, be well and all the best.